Welcome to this lecture, which is number five in the series covering the basics of masonry construction. This lecture looks at historic foundations. The information in this lecture requires you to have at least a basic level of knowledge of what a foundation is and what its purpose is. The previous lecture series had a lecture which talked about loads in buildings, so if you need some reminding, you could watch those lectures first. From those earlier lectures, we know that foundations are those elements of a building which allow the loads from the building above to be transferred effectively to the ground below. In a modern domestic building, this might be a concrete strip foundation of the type shown in the earlier lecture. As a reminder, all buildings need to pass loads vertically downwards to the ground. Loads can be dead loads, i.e. the weight of the building itself and all the permanent fixtures, live loads, the loads associated with temporary aspects of the building, such as people and furniture, and dynamic loads like wind and earthquakes. Historic buildings are no different from modern buildings. The builders of the past understood, through experimentation and presumably a fair amount of failure, that something was required at the base of a wall to help spread the loads of the building. Foundations in classical times were often simply widened bases to the wall placed below the ground, either stepping out or flaring out. Foundations were normally wider than the wall above, but not to the same proportions as a modern foundation would be. The largest buildings in the British Isles, historically, were often defensive structures, such as hill forts or castles. These were usually built upon promontories or outcrops for defensive or surveillance reasons. These locations tended to have very little or no soil over the bedrock, so it was common for walls to be built directly off the top of that exposed bedrock. And indeed, it could still be the case that exposed rock could be built directly on top of, without any excavation, so long as the rock below isn't friable. Loads from the wall and building would have good contact with the bedrock without ha having to pass through subsoil and would be dissipated directly. For tall buildings, it's likely that there would still be widening of the base of the wall, but this is more for stability than for efficient load transfer. Ordinary buildings of a domestic scale were usually located in places where there were a wide variety of ground conditions so building directly onto bedrock wasn't always an option. A great deal of small communities were built around farming and trading centres where there would have been topsoil to contend with. The method seen in building before the 18th century would be to excavate a trench which followed the outline of the building. Into this trench would be placed a series of large boulders which would serve as a wide base for the wall above to be built on. In many older buildings, these boulders are visible at the base of the wall. If you see buildings which have stones like these, then it usually means that there's not a deep foundation below. The next steps in foundation design came with the increased availability of standardised building materials. Bricks of standard size became available throughout the country. Alongside this, there were progressions in regulations and bylaws which described the design of foundations. Buildings were also less likely to be designed using rules of thumb, as knowledge of structures improved. Ground conditions and material properties were better understood. The result of this was the development of the corbelled brick foundation. This required a solid, stepped base built of brick to be placed under each of the load-bearing walls. A deep trench was cut through the soil to a suitable bearing level and a wide base of brick was constructed. The wall above could then be centrally located on top. Loads passing down through the load-bearing walls were able to be spread over a wider footprint, meaning the footing was more effective than a simplistic boulder foundation. The regulations and bylaws introduced to improve the quality of building were prescriptive about the width of the foundation relative to the width of the wall, and they also described how both these measurements were governed by the height of the building above. By the early part of the 20th century, the new wonder material of concrete was beginning to impact on all aspects of construction. The widespread availability of Portland cement caused lime to be replaced as the predominant binder material. Centralised production of Portland cement meant that larger quantities of comparable quality were available to builders, and this material could then be used in foundations. 
Early technical drawings of domestic properties show a concrete strip below a corbelled brick footing. Though strangely, there are still smaller dwarf walls supporting floors at mid-span, which are yet to receive a concrete base. The concrete reduced the need for labour-intensive, and therefore expensive, brickwork in the foundation. A trench could be struck and poured with concrete quite quickly, and then a reduced amount of brick corbelling could be built on top. Once again, the wall would be located centrally in the foundation. The logical development of this type of footing was to omit the brick altogether and replace it with a thicker concrete foundation. The increased depth of concrete was just as easy to pour and it still allowed the loads of the building to be spread over a wide area as the loads could pass at 45 degrees through the concrete to utilise the full width of the footing. To conclude, foundations are fundamental to the proper functioning of a structure. Historic buildings made of masonry had significant dead loads, so needed methods of increasing the contact area to spread loads efficiently. Technical and regulatory changes required incremental improvements in design, which allowed foundations to develop from the simple boulder found to something close to a modern strip foundation. Thank you for listening. As always, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them during the studio workshop.